Um, we'd like to move on to our keynote speaker. Uh, we're very honored to have her with us this afternoon. I would like to welcome the Honorable Maria Lourdes Sereno, Chief Justice of the Republic of the Philippines. Magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat. Malak madami pala talaga tayo dito sa Social Good Summit. At uh, unang-una po, gusto kong kilalanin ang mga mga dignitaries na nandito. Naririnig po, nakikinig po ako kay Senator Bam Aquino. Napakaganda po ng sinabi niya kanina. Uh, kay Ola Almgren, UN Resident Coordinator at si Ambassador Henrietta De Villa ng PPCRV. Si Maria Reza, CEO and Chief Editor ng Rappler. Salamat at pinaalala mong kailangan pa akong magtrabaho hanggang 2030. Kay Glenda Gloria, sa napakaraming mga estudyante dito, mga batang professional, mga social innovators, NGOs and partner organizations at communities, at lahat ng na, mga kaibigan natin na nanonood dito ngayon, sa viewing parties na ginaganap rin sa Cebu at sa Cagayan de Oro City. Napaka-lakas ng enerhiya nga ng uh, pagkakataong ito. At gusto ko ngayong pag-usapan ang sinasabi kong e-justice come alive at real time. Now, allow me to start by blaming people who should be blamed for bringing all of you here to endure listening to the Chief Justice, when most of you would rather not face a judge, much less the Chief Justice. And for bringing me here when I am supposed to be doing something else like writing a decision and not attending a technology conference. First, I blame Maria Reza, where is she? For being so obstinate in insisting that the Chief Justice, who is not a genuine user of social media, who is at most a lurker in Facebook, who doesn't tweet but only reads tweets made on the judiciary, should engage in techno-speak with the geekiest people in the land. Second, all of you here who have made the Philippines the leading social, social media user in the world, even if our internet bandwidth is horrifyingly narrow and thus outrageously slow. I hope they pick up the hint. This is a negative shout out to the two major telcos. And last, I blame my impatience bordering on desperation for pushing me to bring the need to gain more support for the reform that is going on right now in the judiciary to have this conversation with the geekiest of the most social media using people on earth. Now I have entitled my talk, E-Justice Come Alive Real Time. And I hope you see why. I propose we make use of my 20 minutes by trying to achieve two things. First, I will try to explain and gain your support for some of the ICT projects of the judiciary. Second, I will try to publicly think through, and I hope you will help me here, what Maria had been insisting, that I can use social media to achieve what I wish to do for judicial reform, within the bounds that I determine. Our first objective, what the judiciary hopes to achieve, the e-way. Now, our process is called the judicial process. It's our business process. In my ICT mind, that means that, one, any communication that is being done on a person-to-person -person basis, any information that is being recorded or transmitted through a piece of paper or by manual delivery, or any other human activity in the judicial process 
that can be substituted or augmented by an ICT solution should be so substituted or augmented. A judicial process is not so substitutable or augmentable if it requires only a person-to-person -person interaction or requires the use of human judgment and discretion that only sufficient experience and training in the field of law can provide. Now, let me envision to you and explain to you how I envision the judicial process the e-way. Now, a judicial dispute is recorded the moment a complaint or petition is filed in the lower courts or in the higher courts. Now, because these are in paper form, there is really no reason why they cannot be filed electronically. They are accompanied by supporting documents. Some need to be in their original form, such as receipts. But while for purposes of proving the authenticity of the paper version of these documents, and therefore these documents must still physically exist, their graphical images can be captured electronically. In any event, there is no reason why our complaint or petition, even with annexes, cannot be filed digitally from a computer terminal anywhere in the world. This step is called digital filing. For the case to be accepted as part of our judicial records, fees must be paid. Electronic payment is already the norm for many transactions. There is really no reason why e-payments for accessing the judicial system cannot be used as well. The docket number then follows, which is the control number for a case. Thus, the moment a case is accepted, it should form part of any case management system which in its most sophisticated and efficient form should be in an electronic format. The assignment of the case then to a particular branch in a multi-sala station needs to be conducted by raffle instead of the tambiolo or the bingo jar system which is existing today. The raffling can of course be done electronically. The recording of the incidents of the case after it, it has entered the system in its entire life is now being done manually. Reports on the progress of the case is also done manually. Imagine that there are more than 640,000 cases right now that are pending in our lower courts. The clerks of court who have the document management responsibility for these are only around 2,000. On the average, therefore, each should have around 320 cases to, re to manage, whose, but some cases can actually be several feet deep. The distribution of cases also in our courts is terribly skewed, with some courts having more than 3,000 cases and some as little as 30. This is a partial constraint that is forced upon us by, by statute, but I will not spend time right now explaining this phenomenon. Just trust me that for the next five years, this skewed distribution of cases will probably remain. Now, all clerks of court, being the records manager, are required to generate monthly reports. So you can imagine that aside from the, their day-to-day -day functions, they still have to spend considerable time doing the reports by looking at the latest incident in each case file. They would not need to do that unless they have been diligently recording in a separate recording system that they had initiated and designate and designed. And then these monthly reports are mailed to the Supreme Court through the very slow Philippine Postal Office. Imagine the delay in generating the report and the delay from snail mail. The judiciary has many deadlines for promulgation of cases, for the amount of time that the criminal case should remain pending, for actions on motions. There are maximum periods for criminal sentences by which a detention prisoner should automatically be released when that maximum period is reached. There are at least 92,000 detention prisoners in the Bureau of Jail and Management and Penology jails. This number does not include those who are currently being held 
in local police station jails and in provincial jails. An application that alerts the judge of such deadlines can be so readily installed. Unless the judge is not looking at her computer monitor, she should actually be goaded into action by the electronic alarms that are set off. Now, the judge and her legal researcher also needs to research. Computer-aided research, whether through a DVD, CD, or online, is currently available for Philippine legal materials. The Supreme Court and a few commercial companies have made these available. Now, the judge is now contemplating how he will issue orders and decisions. Some of the judge's orders and decisions are commonly issued. So if they are commonly issued orders and decisions, then they can be, of course, templated. Several of our judges actually banded together to generate judicial templates, and these are already available. And again, it can be installed in an electronic court system. Now, when an order is being issued, it was the practice before that it would take around two or three months before the order is generated and mailed. The back and forth, when the judge drafts, edits, gives it to the legal researcher, the legal researcher brings it back, and then the stenographer helps, and ultimately, when she finally signs the order, and then the mailing of the order pushes through, this causes the very long time lag. Can you just imagine, for every incident, it can be delayed by as much as two to three months. We have a breakthrough for this particular component of the trial that I will describe later. Now imagine, all of this being done ma not manually, but if there is an electronic system, then the status of, of cases, instead of being done manually by opening the records of the case and leafing through and looking at the latest incidents can be already generated automatically. As long as the data fields are identified and the data are correctly being entered, then the generation of the monthly reports and a report on the status of the cases would be readily available to the judge. The judge can be guided by graphs, charts, text lines, and she will have the ability to see whether she is complying with all deadlines, whether there are detention prisoners that should immediately be released, whether the age of cases that are pending with her are increasing, or whether in fact she is able to narrow the period between filing and disposition of her cases, even on a general system. You can just imagine how much more efficient the judge can be as a manager. Now, all of the previous processes I described to you in the judicial process are at the presiding judge level. At the top of the presiding judge, in a multi-sala court, you will have an executive judge. And the executive judge must ensure that all the deadlines in the station he or she is leading are being met. She has to know how the judges are individually performing. Presently, there is no way he can or she can do that. However, if we have all of those data available to him because these computers of all the presiding judges are networked to his own computer, then he can have a dashboard that will immediately tell him that he has a laggard in his team. What the judge, executive judge will do then is to call in the presiding judge and talk to her on how to help with her case disposition. Now imagine a world in which right now, you can just imagine that if you are talking about a station, let's say Quezon City, which has 58 salas, 58 computers being linked together with one dashboard that the executive judge can view. Two actually, the executive judge for the second level and another for the executive judge for the first level courts. Imagine if the courts in the Philippines are then networked or connected. 
then all of this data, all of this case status, can be fed into Padre Faura in a dashboard that will be available to the court administrator. Now, even imagine a future where this is fed to my desktop. At a moment's notice, the moment I am alerted to a possible problem, I can immediately investigate and know on real time the status of any case anywhere in the Philippines. That is the future that I imagine for all of us. And you will be able to participate because we can have viewing kiosks by which the lobby or a particular area in a hall of justice can allow one or two or several terminals for the public to use so that the public can immediately check on the status of cases. And imagine if we are able to agree on very tight security protocols if that can be available online. Thus was born the Philippine e-court system. Two of its components, mind you, are the ideas of the judges themselves. And these are the automated hearing system and the judicial form templates. Except for the digital filing and the e-payment system, all of the above com components I described are already existing in the present design of our electronic courts. The, even the electronic assessment of fees is included in the present design. Of course, you cannot just have a system that caters only to adjudication. For this to fully work, the Supreme Court must provide the e-court with the back office support to ensure that an integrated automation system supports the running of the 30,000 strong judiciary. The totality of all of these ICT projects is an ambitious long-term automation program under an umbrella concept called the Judiciary's Enterprise Information System Plan or EISP. Very briefly, the EISP is a five-year master plan that will transform the core like human resources, financial, property, and procurement management. Allow me to state that we already began the procurement of the connectivity services for courts in the NCR, Central Luzon, Calabar Zone, and Central Visayas, and also the network security services. We will procure the connectivity service for courts outside the four regions I mentioned in 2016. We will bid out at least three of the application systems in the last quarter of 2015, beginning in October with our de document records and archive management systems called DREAMS. The total budget for the EISP outside of the e-court component is 3.9 billion pesos. The cost for the e-court's components presently are being shouldered by our development partners, the USAID and eventually the European Union. Later on, much of the e-court's expenses will be shouldered by GAA appropriations. For now, we will not explain other details of the EISP. Now, let me go back to the e-courts. We started mobilizing the e-courts for the e-courts project in 2013. Two years hence, by October 2015, there would already be 98 operational e-courts two weeks from now. 58 in, in Quezon City are already operating, 11 in Angeles City, 4 in Lapu-Lapu City, 18 in Davao City, and yes, in two weeks' time, 7 in Typhoon-devastated Tacloban City. 
By the end of 2015, 30 more in Cebu City will be operational. By the end of 2016, 86 in Manila, 37 in Makati, 21 in Pasig, and 13 in Mandaluyong will be on stream. By the end of 2016, e-courts will be present in 285 trial courts, handling about 30% of the total caseload of the Philippine court system. By 2017, we will start rolling out e-courts in regions 4A, 4B, and the rest of Metro Manila. At the start of 2017, we will then begin to plan how we can put the rest of our courts on e-court mode. Allow me to highlight one component of the e-court system, and this is the automated hearing system. Automated hearing means that during trial, every activity is captured electronically right there and then, including orders issued by the judges, marking of evidence, and other court processes. This is facilitated because even right now, even without the full complement of the e-court system, the judge, stenographers, and interpreters, computers are linked. And they, are, they, are, they have a uh, printer right in the courtroom. And when the editing is done, all of the three actors are allowed to view on real time the editing of the documents that are being prepared. One judge even installed at his own cost a monitor on his wall so that even the public could simultaneously view the editing of the document he is generating. And as soon as the order is printed out, it is within minutes served on the parties. No more waiting for snail mail. So revolutionary was this that we ha even have stories about, uh, we will, I will tell you vignettes later on about how the e-court has created significant impact on the way uh, the public is viewing those who are already seeing automated hearing. Now, in brief, our system is speeding up court action by facilitating the issuance of orders and decisions. The judge has improved management capability because monitoring of cases is now automated. Case backlogs are cut because the dashboard provides judges with information that will assist him in facilitating, facilitating the disposition of cases that are aging and new case incidents that require immediate action. Public access is increased through information kiosks where status of information can immediately be found. It will also bolster transparency because the raffling of cases is done electronically without any human intervention. In short, the e-court system is proving itself to be an effective monitoring tool for court performance. And how much of a game changer can it be? Now, the vignettes. Some lawyers have written congratulatory letters to our judges. Meron ding mga abogado na nagpapa-selfie sa mga automated hearing system together with the order that is being handed out right from the judge's desk. In the very first automated hearing in the Davao City Regional Trial Court, a long-time detainee was ordered, released from detention right there and then. And for a moment, they stood still. What does it mean? They could not believe that the order of release was immediately encoded and printed while the detainee was still in front of the judge and served on him and his counsel. It was so unprecedented that the by police witnesses whose testimonies are vital, especially in drug cases. Any delay in the trial means more unjust detention and more prison congestion. Now, how does it work? By the plain email of the subpoena from our trial court to the police station with a CC to Central PNP, police attendance improved to an estimated 97% as reported by the participants in the Quezon City e-subpoena system. The key to the high attendance rate is the signed undertaking by the PNP that any report of non-attendance automatically leads 
to an administrative show cause order to the non-attending police. And we will eventually roll out the system to other cities. Now, there are many other ga cha game-changing reforms in the judiciary, but for now, we will uh, content ourselves with a discussion on these points because these reforms are not mainly in the ICT area. Now, our second objective, how do we use social media to enhance judicial reform with judiciary appropriate parameters? To many of you, in fact, perhaps all of you, it would seem sensible for me to direct the judiciary to go full steam ahead in the social media waterway. After all, our PIO chief, Teddy Te, is lightly doing that. My chief of staff, attorney Lourdes Oliveros, is also leading limited discussions from time to time. If we were to use social media as a platform for our internal information and education campaign, I would surmise that the resulting problems could be somehow manageable. But I hesitate to give my blessing on making the social media platform a regular mode for engaging the external public. The difficulty has to do with the culture that the Chief Justice needs to preserve if the judiciary is to properly discharge its constitutional role. Allow me to explain. First, the judiciary is required by its nature to be the most formal branch of government, and the judge the most neutral, thus the most formal of all public officials. We need to constantly maintain a degree of aloofness to avoid inappropriate chumminess that is why we judges are required to limit our social interactions because our behavior is always being observed and also because we need to avoid associations with political or business networks. Second, every judge is also required to think before she speaks, to keep her thoughts on political and social issues to herself, lest when a case of related import presents itself, she will be placed in a conflict of interest situation or she would be perceived to have prejudged the case due to a publicly expressed pre-existing inclination. Thus, the inherent danger of opinion posts by judges. Third, the judiciary must be the foremost practitioner of due process. We cannot be party to any activity that encourages accusations to be lightly made without evidence or where the accuser is not willing to put under oath her accusations. Fourth, it might be terribly frustrating for many social media habitues to have a judiciary forum where no discussion on any pending or imminent case, including on its incidents, personalities, or relevant theories can be made. If the judiciary is to engage in social media and receive feedback, then it must do so within these parameters. It could mean a heavily mediated forum with strict rules but the strictness of the rules themselves might be difficult, especially for social media users in a country with a very vocal press. The charge of opaqueness or lack of transparency or even defensiveness can be easily hurled against the judiciary and the administrators of such a forum. I thought, what about mediation? Mediation by credible outsiders might be needed so that there can be a buffer between the participants and the members of the judiciary. But then the presence of mediators by itself can create untoward problems. But I see the potential of social media. 
if only a fraction of the attention given to Aldab can be lavished on issues affecting the justice system. If only a hashtag such as Justicia Ngayon Na can be retweeted <laughs> to give justice reform both public support and urgency as a national priority, if only netizens will appreciate the initiative and creativity of some of our judges in using technology and homegrown management solutions to bring about justice, then truly the Filipino people will reap the best that technology can offer even in the arena of justice reform. I think of the potential that can be unleashed if we were to start a national conversation on the state of the Filipino family as seen through the eyes of our family court judges or of the menace of drug addiction, child pornography, and trafficking, again, as evidenced by our court records. We judges also have a story to tell, and our hearts have been heavy with sad stories for more decades than we care to count. We also need to hear a shout out for the brave men and women who day in and day out, quietly and sincerely do their best to render justice. However, too close an interaction between the formal institution I represent and the whirling world of social media can also create serious difficulties. Our judges, the guardians of our democracy, must be assured the austere, reflective space that best engenders impartial judging. I have told our ICT story. I see the potential of social media in judicial reform. I am aware of the dangers, but I'm also here to listen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief Justice Sereno. Um, we would now like to, uh, well, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, the Chief Justice will be Chief Justice until 2030. That's a good 18 years. So um, the things that she... And the great thing about that is that means continuity. Um, the things that she spoke about um, in terms of reforms are probably things that will not just be thought about, but these are things that we can look about, uh, look, look forward to as being actually implemented. Um, so thank you very much once again, ma'am.